In this section, we're going to be solving equations. So part of this is going to bring through our knowledge of the unit circle, um, forming equations, as well as using our inverse functions that we talked about. So we focused on the inverse functions of sine, cosine, tangent. So part of our solving process will be getting equations so that we have our trig function equals some number. So in this case, we're working with sine, but we'll have cases where we have cosine or tangent over there. If we see any of our other trig functions, then we would just use those properties of our identities to switch it to one of these three main trig functions. All right, so let's talk about the solving process. So here I have sine of x is equal to one half. And keep in mind that in this function, it's like there are parentheses there. X is the input for our sine function. So X is some angle measurement. And we know that when we take sine of that angle measurement, we get one half out. So what this is really asking here is what angle X has a, and then since it's sine, we're thinking about our Y coordinate on the unit circle. So y coordinate of one half. So that phrasing right there, the idea of solving for an angle given a coordinate, that's our setup for our inverse function. In fact, we're going to switch to our inverse notation here so that if we wanted to solve for an angle, what we can do is have x come outside of sine. But in order to do that, we need to be taking the inverse sine of the other side. So you could think of this a few ways. One way to think about this is just kind of translating between our inverse and non-inverse format. So where angle is the input, y coordinate is the output, and we just switch to angle equals, and then the input becomes that y coordinate. Um, another way that this is described sometimes is taking the inverse sign of both sides of the equation. Like in a longer format, how I could have written this, just to get that out of the way, is like taking inverse sine of sine of x, and then that equals, and then taking inverse sine of the other side as well. So taking inverse sine of both sides of the equation. And then what would happen is we have that property where inverse with its original function would kind of just cancel out with each other. So then we would just have x equals inverse sine of 1 half. So that's kind of two explanations, but basically we want to get to this setup right here so that we're solving for x. So there's our inverse sine. So what we did was we would go to the unit circle like we did in the last section. So I'm going to draw my circle here. And what I know is I have a y coordinate of 1 half. Now what we talked about is that with inverse sine, that only showed up over here. And let's see, y coordinate of 1 half. So that's going to be at our angle measurement of pi over 6. Now, what we're doing in this section, even though we're using this inverse trig function, we're using the same setup, there's a little change to it. So what we were doing in the last section was simplifying expressions. We were simplifying, and then if we wanted to simplify this inverse sine of 1 half, we just wanted one solution, and that's where we use this. What changes when we're solving equations, when we're dealing with an equation, we want all possible solutions. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through that format and using what we learned in the last, last section, but we need to kind of expand it to, well, what other possibilities are there? Where else do we have a y coordinate of positive 1 half? Well, if we reflect that over, if there's our y equals positive 1 half, we could also have this case that was outside of how we limited our inverse function because here we have more possibilities since we want to know every possible value for x that we can plug in. So this, these are going to relate together, these angles. So we're dealing with our pi over 6. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 
5 pi over 6. So with that, we get a second angle measurement. So in terms of within our unit circle, so if I just kind of think from this limitation, so where we're stuck between 0 and 2 pi, so I could phrase that as like on this range from 0 to 2 pi, the possibilities for x, x can be equal to pi over 6, or it could be equal to 5 pi over 6. So what we see are two possible solutions there. However, there are even more possibilities. But this is going to be one way that we phrase our solution is kind of over a set domain for our possible values for our input or for our variable there. Um, what are the possibilities just within like a single unit circle? But then what if we expand it even further? Like what if I took this to the graph of sine? Meaning, I'm going to dra graph sine down here. So if I graph sine over a few periods, let's say something like that, and as symmetric as I can, yeah, not too bad. All right, so here's our function sine of x. Sorry, that makes it look like I'm on the x-axis there. That's our graph sine of x. Now, if I graph this function where sine of x has an output of one half, what that would look like is a horizontal line at x equals, or sorry, y equals one half. And what we're looking for here in solving this equation is all possible solutions, which the solutions come through as the intersection points. And as you can see, there are many intersection points, especially if I kept graphing further and further out, there are infinitely many solutions here. They're happening at very specific spots, but there are infinitely many of them because our graph is periodic and it's just gonna keep repeating. Now we actually already found two of these coordinates right here, these first two. We found there is pi over six. Here is five pi over six. So the two possible solutions that are occurring from zero to two pi, so there's our single period there. We can see those two intersections. And the idea is, what if we went beyond that? Or you could think in terms of on this unit circle, your coterminal angles, like where we have pi over six here. Well, what if we did a full circle and then pi over six? Or what if we did two revolutions and then pi over six? Or what if we went in the negative direction and got to pi over six? So many possibilities there. But I like to show this graph here to really visualize how there's these infinitely many possibilities. Now, I'm going to change colors a little bit here because there are coordinates here that connect with each other. So the dots that I left in red there connect to each other the idea of covering a single period from this pi over 6 here to get back to that value right there, kind of this beginning before you hit the maximum value and that same shape over there, that's going to be a distance of 2 pi. Similarly, if I go to that red dot to the left, that's covering a distance of 2 pi. And same thing to that other red dot. We're repeating these values, this kind of this increment that covers a single period. And the same thing is happening with the green dots. They repeat each other over this distance of 2 pi. And it's because of that period of sine. So what we're seeing is that we have this kind of starting value, like if we're thinking about our pi over 6 as our starting value, it's that we're seeing these solutions every increment of 2 pi. Similarly, if we start at 5 pi over 6, every increment of 2 pi away from 5 pi over 6. Visually on the unit circle, that's the idea of moving like 2 pi would be going around the circle and back to that value or like starting at that value and then going a full circle, something like that. So this is where we get a little tricky. We're going to bring through that idea of 
how we formed the domain for tangent and cotangent and cosecant and secant. Remember how we described these asymptotes as happening every like so many increments and we use the letter k which we had represent an integer to kind of give us that spacing same idea here so what we're going to do is to list all possible solutions let's say i wanted to describe this pi over six and then any, any increment of two pi away from that pi over six so how i would describe that is we're going to have a set of values 4x, which is defined by, and what we could say is that x is equal to, so pi over 6 is a possibility, plus any multiple of 2 pi away from that value. So how I'm going to write that is plus 2 pi times this letter k, where I'm going to have k be an integer. So this right here is going to take care of that idea of pi over 6 is a possibility if we plugged in 0. If I plugged in a positive 1 there, then that would be taking pi over 6 plus 2 pi, which would land us right there. I could plug in a negative 1, a negative 2, and that's going to get me all of those values there. Now this is one set of solutions, but we have a second set that we can have in there. So I'm going to put in or x can equal, and now I want to describe that 5 pi over 6, and then adding on these increments of 2 pi. So with that, if I plugged in 0, I'd have my 5 pi over 6. If I added 2 pi, that would take me to that value up there. If we subtract 2 pi, that one, so it'll have me jump the correct increments to land back at that intersection value. And I'm just going to throw in where k is an integer. Okay, so this is the process that we're going to be going through with these. We're going to start with an equation and we're going to rearrange things until we can essentially solve for our variable, which with these trigonometric equations is going to lead to an inverse trig function. So we're going to work with our inverse trig function just as we did before, like we did here. But what we'll have to think about is the other possibilities as well. And when we use our calculator, we'll just have to keep in mind that our calculator operates in those domains and restrictions that we talked about in the last section. So we'll look at a case with a calculator. Um, with these cases where it's the special values that we're used to seeing on our unit circle, those we can map a little more easily, um, and we don't need the calculator, but we just need to think of symmetry. So here it was the fact that y is a positive one-half, so we end up with those two possibilities. So with the unit circle and looking at the unit circle, we can get an idea of some possible values just within that domain of 0 to 2 pi. But if we want a more complete description of our solutions, where we really need to describe all possible solutions, we need to get this idea that there's infinitely many of them, and we basically create these equations to describe where these solutions are occurring. Now what makes up this, uh, these values is going to be the values we're seeing from our unit circle, and then the fact that we're working with sine here, and sine of x has a period of 2 pi. So we're going to keep in mind the period of our function that we're working with, which sine and cosine will be 2 pi. We'll just have to be careful when we deal with tangent, because that'll be a period of pi. But it'll be that increment that we want to add on so that we get these jumps that land at all of these possible solutions that we want to see. All right, so we're going to see lots of examples with these. Don't worry, this isn't a one and done thing. We're going to see all sorts of situations, and I'll go through this process each time of looking at the unit circle and forming the equations. Um, sometimes with my open math or on the homework, they'll just ask for one of these. But with the examples we look through together, I'll be sure to go through both. So you're seeing a lot of those cases. So to find all solutions, First, we use symmetry on the unit circle to find any other possible locations that satisfy, and we're going to focus on that 0 to 2 pi. So that was our first step up here. 
And then the second step, which we did down here, is to use the period of the function to help identify all angles um, that end at each location we found. So that first one, it's just going to be a list of the angles. And then down here, it's like we're going to form an equation. And it will be creating a set of values. So we'll use our set notation for that angle measurement. And then we'll just need to form some equation that works to land on those specific values. Um, and part of that will be focusing on the period of our function. All right, so in the next video, we'll go through a few examples with these.